Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Softball Canada Speaker Series presented by Rawlings Canada. Today's webinar is Warrior in the Circle with our guest speaker, Danielle Laurie, from our Canadian Women's National Team. Although the softball season is currently suspended due to the coronavirus situation, we are happy to have the opportunity to engage with everyone listening at home, and we hope you will enjoy listening to our great speakers. Bonjour à tous et bienvenue à la série de webinaires de Softball Canada présentée par Rawlings Canada. Le webinaire d'aujourd'hui est Guerrière dans le cercle avec notre invité spécial Daniel Laurie de l'équipe nationale féminine. Quoique la saison de softball est présentement suspendue en raison de la situation COVID-19, on est heureux d'avoir la chance de nous engager avec vous et on espère que vous aimerez écouter à nos excellents invités. Before we get started, we want to thank everyone for joining us and for following the social distancing measures as directed by the Government of Canada and your local health authorities. Softball Canada is monitoring the situation closely and is posting regular updates on its website. Please continue to follow the government's COVID-19 prevention measures to help flatten the curve, and we will be back on the field as soon as it is safe to do so. Avant de commencer, on veut vous remercier d'être avec nous et de suivre les mesures de distanciation sociale telles identifiées par le gouvernement du Canada et vos autorités locales de soins de la santé. Softball Canada surveille la situation de près et publie des mises à jour régulières sur son site web. Veuillez continuer à suivre les mesures de prévention du gouvernement du Canada pour aider à rétrécir la courbe et on sera de retour sur le terrain dès que ce sera possible d'y retourner. This webinar series is presented by our proud partners at Rawlings Canada. Rawlings is the official softball of Softball Canada, the Canadian Championships, and the national team programs. Cette série de webinaires est présentée par nos fiers partenaires à Rawlings Canada. Rawlings est la balle officielle de Softball Canada, des championnats canadiens et des programmes des équipes nationales. Allow me to introduce Angela Valentine, uh, the manager of long-term player development programs at Softball Canada, who will be your host for today's webinar. So welcome, Angela. Thanks so much, Jill. Awesome. So we are going to get started um, and good evening everyone. Uh, we have done eight uh, previous webinars so far and each panelist holds um, an incredible list of accolades and today is no different. Uh, we're thrilled to have with us Danielle um, and as a mom myself I can appreciate how hard it is to find time in your day. So um, we are very, very thankful that you're here to, to speak with us today. Um, I'm going to go over uh, your bio. It's the shortest version we could come up with, so just bear with me. Uh, Danielle is a member of the 2003 Junior Women's National Team, played it on the development team in 04 before joining the senior team in 05. She is a 2008 Olympian who has played in four WBSC World Championships, earning a pair of bronze medals, and also competed in the Pan American Games, earning two silvers. Uh, Danielle is a two-time NCAA Collegiate Player of the Year. Uh, you won a College World Series in 09 and two NPF Cowles Cup Championships. Uh, and to top that all off, you played two years of professional softball in Japan. Um, that is quite a list of achievements, and I'm sure that I've glossed over a few that could we could talk about for a lot longer. Um, but thanks so much for being here. This is uh, very exciting, and we're we're excited to to have a chat today. So this is great. I'm stoked to be here. Thanks for asking. So I'm hoping that we can kind of go back and you can tell us about growing up in Langley and kind of how you just started playing softball and how pitching came to be your position. Yeah. Wow. It's crazy. So many, I think during this time right now, it's just given you so many feels of just being able to reflect on stuff like that. You know, very, there's not very many times in your life you're stuck at home where it's <laughs> thinking, and thinking, but um, you know, I, I haven't seen my parents since January. And that to me, you know, for someone that is as close with my family, it's it's gut wrenching for me. And I think that's definitely been the hardest part about all of this. But, um, you know, I talk with them a ton and I really think about my upbringing with them and my brother, who's a baseball guy, too. And I'm just so fortunate that um, I had two parents that were extremely loving, um, but also both very different. You know, my mom was very sweet and able to just kind of reel it in when we needed a break or when we needed like 
extra love. And I think my dad was really big on being able to be tough because he saw something really great in us. And um, I, you know, remember our upbringing being very competitive. And we started training at really young ages, you know, like six, seven, eight years old going through some, not like crazy, crazy stuff, but like we were working hard and we were doing a lot of baseball stuff. I mean, I grew up playing baseball. I switched over when I was, um, I got, ended up getting cut from the Little League All-Star team. Mm -hmm. it was, and I was devastated, right? Um, and I think that was 10, 10 U. And I ended up getting cut and my dad pulls me aside and he's just like, okay, let's look at the bigger picture here. Like, yes, you're one of the best players on the team, but this is a situation, there's nothing we can do. And let's start to figure out, like, if this is something that you are passionate about, as far as how the baseball stuff works, um, there's not a whole lot of opportunity for you. And I mean, you hate hearing that, but it's so true. I mean, you don't hear about women in MLB, you don't hear about many women that go play college baseball. Um, so in that moment, hearing that hard news at 10 was a lot, but I also love the fact that him, him saying, like, you're still one of the best players on the team. You just have to remember it is because you're a girl. That sucks. Mm -hmm. um, that's what's always allowed for me to like be a strong female athlete and to always know that I can compete with the boys because of like a situation like that. Like the intimidation factor is huge, even for those boys at 10 years old against me. So <laughs> I think that, and we kind of went on a mission after that had happened where we switched over. We found a, like a little softball rep team, and I was terrible, right? Like we're talking like you've never played the game of softball and all of a sudden you want to be a pitcher, okay? It just doesn't work that way. And I still remember to this day, the coach's name was Debbie and her daughter was Lindsay. And you know, back in the day, like the coach's kid would pitch every mm -hmm. game. I was working my butt off. Like I would do like the slingshot pitch, like not even the full circle, <laughs> like the slingshot up to down and we would <laughs> We would work reps in the backyard and we were just going to town and I didn't pitch much the first year and that was okay. But then luckily I, we switched teams to the Langley rebels and rusty Consmo was my coach. And he was one of the best guys because he was so selfless with his work ethic with us and like would just teach us and fundamentals and his daughter ended up giving me pitching lessons. And then it just kind of went from there where, I started to learn not only was I really big and strong was that I had the ability to throw really hard. So it was like, this is super fun because I can literally try to strike everybody out and <laughs> I, it's in my control. So I ended up falling in love with the game based on the whole baseball to softball, but learning how to pitch and, and learn the right way just allowed for me to fall in love with being in control in the circle. Sounds like you had a lot of people other than your parents as well in your in your corner that were supporting you who who were some of those people you named one one coach there were who are some other people that have kind of helped you along the way rick sullivan um coached me with the white rock renegades for a while and i would say he was my number one guy growing up because like there'd be times when he worked with like the border control up by white rock so they had these facilities where we could go in and literally just train and he could open it up at any time and like I would go and, and pitch with him two to three times a week. And there'd be times he'd come and pick me up after school and we'd go to Noel Booth there. And my dad would meet us after work. And he saw something in me um, that I didn't even see in myself at that time. So it was just like he ignited something because he was giving me his time, never charged a dime. That's what's mm. the most amazing thing about all of this is like he gave so much to me, but never expected anything back. And I've always been one of the most like loving people on him like when I was inducted into the hall of fame he's the number one guy that I wanted there to come down and like when we won the national championship he's one of the guys that I called you know as soon as we got back to Washington mm -hmm. because it's like, for them to know how much they've impacted your journey means yeah. the world and I just think mm -hmm. it's so great to be able to give back to the game and remember who helped get you there and he was definitely one of my number one guys and and I just think about the family piece. Like I think about obviously my mom and dad, but like I had the most loving grandparents that came to everything they could and I missed them terribly. And, you know, I have so many memories of my grandma going to the Olympics in 08 in the stands. Yeah. And when we won the national championship, she was in the stands and um, she came to Japan and watched me when I was in that pro league. And she was in her eighties and she hopped on a plane. And I mean, selfless people that have helped me 
live out this passion as long as I've been able to. I'm not the same person, um, obviously, without them. And that's pretty special that this sport has allowed you to have so many of these special memories in your life. Um, mm -hmm. Like just that your grandma would travel all the way to Japan. For her, that's a pretty, I bet you that was a big life moment. So that's that's pretty incredible what softball has done has done in that aspect for you. And it's crazy because, you know, she came over there and when she um, ended up passing away a couple of years ago, my translator, <clears throat> who's still one of my good friends, Crokey's with the same team, but she mailed me all the letters that her and my, my grandma exchanged. Oh, wow. So it was just like such a, you know, like it gives me goosebumps thinking about that. But that experience for my grandma to go over there and do that, especially after she had lost my, my grandpa, you know, yeah. <laughs> I think... So it was such an amazing time for her to be able to spend time with me, but to be able to just like experience culture. Like at 80 yeah. years old, you're going over to Japan by yourself. And it was tough to get her there. Like I had to <laughs> chair here to there to, she's like, what's going to happen when I go to Tokyo? I'm not going to be able to talk to anyone. I'm like, there will be a wheelchair waiting as soon as you land, it takes you from A to B. And then I will be there as soon as you get there. So it was just, it was amazing. If I could go back and do it again, I would, because it was just a special time for all of us. That's kind of neat, because it's really telling of the softball community as well, right? Like this this team in Japan that's welcoming your your family. Um, I think that's, that's pretty awesome. Um, yes. So that kind of leads into my next question. You've played all over the world. Um, where has been your most favorite place that you've you've been? Man. I really liked playing over in Japan. Yeah. I really did. I um, loved it. I also really liked it when we went to Thailand. We played, God, I can't oh. remember what team it was. It's when we played in Bangkok with the younger team. We ended up winning. Lori Sippel was the coach. It all blends in. But when we got to go <laughs> to play, it was kind of like mini Olympics. Like, huh. um, but that was pretty special because I think I got to like see stuff that wasn't normal, right? Like we were in downtown Bangkok. It was like a hangover style. Like getting to <laughs> like, wow, we live such a different life. And I, I love the culture shock piece because it just gives you another element to just respect the game, you know, because we're so fortunate for what we're given as far as coaching equipment like anything that we need to help us and better us and some of these places don't even you know have the ability to to get the proper stuff for their athletes but they're still loving the game and respecting the game so i love being able to go there i mean i've traveled a bunch of spots i love going to venezuela the crowds were crazy yeah um i've been really lucky to to, to go to a lot of cool spots and hopefully uh, another cool experience in the next year, but we'll get to that in a little bit. Um, I am hoping that you can tell us, uh, and I know this is something that, that we've chatted about, but I want to know um, about your training. Um, mm -hmm. You know, you are pretty vocal on social media about how hard it can be, how hard the grind can be, but how much you love it and how much, um, how much work you're putting into it. So can you kind of tell us about that mentality and how, um, you're embracing that part of it? Yeah, you know, that's something I was really lucky to learn at a young age. You know, the stuff in the middle is the best part because we are never guaranteed anything. Like these athletes that are tuning in and watching this, like you're not guaranteed to get a scholarship to play softball, right? So it's like at the end of the day, I think you really have to understand your why and as far as why you enjoy doing it. Um, and remember that at the end of the day it's the game of life right so it's like everything that we put in the middle to train and work hard and do the hardest stuff when no one's watching it's like that's what creates character that's what creates champions that's where you build yourself up to be able to go to war on some of the hardest moments right and it's like sometimes people need a lot more guidance in those types of areas and i, I felt like i've always been able to understand myself as far as like okay what do i need to feel like i'm at my best obviously training with your team and doing what's necessary and like coaching and instruction and all that but like in order for me to feel fearless or me to feel like i can go into some of the biggest moments and endure pressure um it's making sure that you've checked the boxes for 
So the work ethic, the the grind workouts where you're putting in the time or you're going to D-bats to go train and pitch three nights a week when it's raining sideways and you're just like, my kids are sleeping in this warm bed and I'm out here like dog tired, like putting in the work. And it's like, those are like the times where I really have to like dig deep. And then yeah. it solidifies for me why I came back into the game because I love it. Like I love doing that because to me that just – it shows number one that like I'm strong as ever and I can do whatever I say that I'm going to do and that I don't ever give up on me. And I think that that's been the most important part about coming back into the game, especially with the family piece. It's like, I'm going to put myself first and I'm going to work my tail off for the common goal of the team. And yes, I have the Olympic experience from 2008 and I, I, I want to have a different ending. I want to have a different storybook ending. And the selflessness that goes into that is something that not a lot of people understand and that's okay. But, um, I would rather leave no stone unturned in this work ethic and this journey to be able to leave the Olympics potentially in 2021 with whatever happens to be at peace with it. And that's yeah. almost the hardest, thing, right? Cause in 08, I was salty. I left, I was mad. I was sad. I was just every emotion under, under like the sun, but I was going back to play college ball and I had like, so much going for me on, on that level. So for me, it's like after 2021, like I'm done, right? right? So it's like, I need to make sure that I check off, obviously the boxes need to be checked for my team, but I wanna be as physically conditioned as I can be. I wanna know that I've worked as hard as I possibly can. And it's not to say that I do it to be better than anyone else. I almost do it with the mentality of like, I need to know that I put the hay in the barn or the mental piggy bank, they say. So then when I get to those moments of like where you're grinding, where you need it, where you're doubting yourself, that's where you got to pull from that. Because it's like you can't expect greatness without sacrificing more than you could ever imagine. It just doesn't work that way. Um, and I know that. And being told at seven, eight, nine years old to not just do something to do it, but to do it with intent, to do yeah. it with the understanding of like, I want to be the best at it. Right. Like I. I'm having a tough time, I think, with having little girls, like trying to figure out how to parent that way, right? And let my six year old mm -hmm. Maddie know, like, when you do something, do it with intent, like teaching them the understanding of winning, whether we're walking to the mailbox, like, okay, I'm going to beat you. And then we run there. Like, I just remember that was what happened for my brother and I, and I love it. And those were some of the best times of my life. So I'm so lucky to be in this position that I'm in. Yes, it's a grind right now, and doing this for an additional year isn't easy. <laughs> um, but it's another year that I get to potentially get better. And, yeah. you know, today, as hard as this time is, I mean, I was chatting with you about this yesterday. It's almost a blessing in disguise for me because the last three years have been so wicked hard as far as like mommy's coming and going. I'm away from my kids for some days, three weeks at a time. And that really takes a toll on like my kids. So I think for me, this time being steady and home and just focusing on my training and my family will allow for once September comes to be able to know like, okay, you have the next nine months to train and you've got to fill this family emotional bucket as full as you possibly can. So when it's time to go to work, like it's time to go to work. And it's not to say it won't be hard with the kid piece, but this is a lot of time with your kids as you know. <laughs> yes, I do. <laughs> it's almost like I'll be looking forward to you know, once September comes, like it's go time. Obviously we're training and doing what we need to do now, but like September is when the selfless potential time away from my family happens and I'm okay with it because I know if you want something that bad, it takes great sacrifice and yeah, I'm willing to do it. Do you think that, that they know what mom does? Do you think that they, when they see mom on TV or on the field, they can appreciate that that's why you're putting in all that work? I think, I think my oldest does. Um, so cute. Like a friend sent, you know, I, I saw these things going around online viral. There were these Tokyo 2020 Barbies, right? Yes. So, so you know, I couldn't get my hands on them to save my life. I couldn't find them anywhere. And this gal had reached out on Instagram and her and I had chatted a little bit throughout the years, but she's like, I'd love to send you these Barbies. She was a manager at Target and she sent me them. The most oh. selfless thing 
ever. I remember being like, this is like the beauty in like people, you know what I mean? Like she's reaching out, she has a way to get this because she knows how much it means to me. Like they're both these dolls are sitting in their room, but yeah. they open them. <laughs> you know, like Maddie's just like, this is so cool. Like this is like, they have like a medal and the 2020 and she's like, when we come and watch you in the Olympics, like can we open these dolls and have them in the stands and I just think like my oldest definitely knows and she sees me working to say she understands realistically yeah. why I do it. No, but I know she's definitely watching. And I think that's yeah. the big medicine that you can give someone is just like, watch me work, watch me set a goal. Like I went back to play and Maddie was um, three and Angie was nine months. And now here we are and they're little women, you know, like yeah. Maddie's old she's looking like she's 16 and <laughs> we realize how fast time goes and it's not a bad thing but um I just want to make them proud and I wanted to see this through and when they made the decision to postpone the Olympics there was a part of me that didn't want to do it again because it is a year of sacrifice and time away and nannies and a lot of things that people don't really understand right and um I think at the end of the day it came down to me realizing like I set this goal and what would that look like in 10 years to Maddie and them if I just didn't do it because it was too hard yeah and that's what made me realize that and it's just like as hard as it will be like one day they will just respect the crap out of this because they'll truly know like and remember like Maddie will and I visualize my kids up in the stands, like taking everything in and being able to like look at them as nervous as I know we all will be at the Olympic Games if that does happen, but taking in the fact that they're there and it's happened and the work that we've put in has led us to this moment and um, to just take in what the game has given us. And it's an additional year to get better as a squad and hopefully help yeah. our chances, you know, and fighting for, for a gold medal. Well, I think they're pretty lucky to have a gold medal like you. Um, and on that, there's a lot of girls that follow you. They're following your career. They're following your training. Do you feel mm -hmm. pressure from being that role model to to not just your own kids, but to other to other young ladies? No, I don't feel pressure because this is just me. Yeah. So it's like I don't put on a placade to be something that I'm not. And when yeah. you do that, when you run into trouble. So I think for me, it's like okay, I can talk the talk, but like, I'm also walking the walk. So like, I'm still playing the game. I'm still working harder than a lot of other people. Um, you know, I, I want to help grow this game as much as I can. And I think the more you connect with people and share your story, and if something sits with them where they're able to be like, wow, I can relate, or I totally understand where she's coming from, or man, she really worked hard. I got to be better at, then I'm doing my job, you know? Yeah, and absolutely. At the end you always want to leave the game better than when you found it. And I'm always going to just continue to keep giving. So what do you think um, on that note, what do you think the biggest change you've seen in the game has been um, over the years? I don't know if it's a good thing. I, I see a lot of entitlement in young women growing up in this game. And I think that there's been a lot of pressure on athletes growing up to play it because the end of the day, and I don't know if this so much is for a lot of young women growing up in Canada, but being in the States and being around it, um, it's like people think that they're entitled to stuff or like you see back in the day when they're doing all these scouting tournaments and coaches are going to go watch. Back in the day when I was getting recruited, it was like a coach came to watch your team play and how that all went down. And now I think it's a little different where it's like they have these big exposure things where you're watching just athletes individually do their thing. And it takes away from the structure of like, I love seeing people in the raw moments of like pitching in a big game or striking out on one of the biggest stages and seeing how they react or after games of struggle, um, seeing how people respond to their parents or their teammates and how the dynamic between that stuff is. Because what a lot of athletes need to understand is if you're going to try to potentially call it softball, you need to look at this as someone's going to invest in you as if you were a part of their family. So right. I'm not going to invest in someone that, you know, isn't the hardest worker, isn't the most respectful person on their team, um, doesn't try to pick their teammates up when they're at their lowest. Because at the end of the day, I was lucky enough to be like, have Heather invest in me. And like, I can honestly say, like, I wouldn't have been able to play college softball based on the like, 
um, my, what is it called? Exchange fee with, with Canada, US? Sorry, I'm losing my mind. There's no way my parents, number one, could have afforded it, and I would never have asked them to spend over $60,000 a year American yeah. for me to play. So it's like I learned that so quick that the respect for me is huge. Like, I'm thankful for this opportunity, and I have it, and I'm going to give you everything I possibly can because look at this opportunity you are giving me. And I think at times I can just see athletes maybe not be as grateful as they need to be, not as many thank yous to their parents that they need to be. Um, but there's also a lot more pressure than there was when I was playing the right. game because I played other sports that allowed for me to realize I love softball, work harder than ever at softball, but also get to get away from the game because I love playing basketball. I love playing soccer. I got to just test myself in other ways, but appreciate the game more than ever because I got to spend time away from it at times. You were talking about some of the attributes of being a good teammate. What what do you think makes you a good teammate with your group right now? Yeah, it, I've come a long way. Um, and I was not a bad teammate, but I think about the 2008 experience that I had and just turning 21 years old before that Olympics. Like I wish I had the knowledge I had now to be able to number one, have the hard conversations with people. You know, not to say that I was intimidated of people, but I was playing with some women that were, you know, six, seven, eight years older than me. And that's yeah. a hard pill to swallow when at times you never feel like they accept you to the extent that they accept everybody else. Right. And Oh, I wish that I would have been able to have the conversations with the people that I was almost at times uncomfortable with so they could help me. And I also wish that the vets back then were like the vets that we have now on the squad, because I feel like I would be someone that could have the conversation with someone now as an older person to say like, dude, you're so good. But right now what you are giving you could give more or you could show more. You need to do more opposed to maybe personally attacking them or making them feel like they're not worthy because that does nothing. The last right. thing I want to do is attack another female or make her feel less than when we're trying to fight for the common goal of winning a gold medal, right? So it's like I've got that now. So I think what I really value about myself and our vets on our team is that – and also what I've loved about the Michael Jordan documentary is he – expected greatness from his team but he would never ask them to do anything that he does not do and right. that's something that I value so much because it's like yes this quarantine has been difficult but I think it's allowed for myself and us vets to really figure out like okay what's the expectation for the next 15 months because if we had any doubt about this person or that person or the goals or this we have to shift it to figure it out because now we've been giving this given this blessing to do it again but like i'm never going to ask someone to work harder or do something that i will not do or i am not expecting um to put ourselves through the ringer as as a group so it's like i feel like i can have those hard conversations now if i need to um but i, I mean i'm always going to respect people i'm not i'm never going to give people any reason to not like me aside from me just wanting to make them better, if that makes sense. If I'm yeah, on no. you in a respectful way, it's because I know you're going to be a huge part of this team and where we're trying to go. Um, yeah. And at the end of the day, you got to trust your vets. you got to trust the ones that have been there. We have a chance to have four Olympians on this team that went in 08, and that is a lot more than any other team by far. So I think that's yeah. something to value in itself. So right now, considering we're all dealing with this pandemic, how are you guys as a team connecting? And how are the vets kind of doing that with some of the younger younger ladies? Luckily, I like the vets. And they're kind of like my best friends. So we, I mean, we talk almost every day. We have a text chain. We're always like exchanging just like our thoughts on stuff. And um, I mean, we have mandatory Zoom sessions Monday nights where we talk as a team. Uh, we have mandatory lifts. And people don't always have everything they need to get what they need done as far as equipment, but people are doing what they need to do. Um, and I think just having structure is something that helps with some of the women on the team. Like, I could, I look at this time and it'd be like, if you didn't give me anything, I'd still be more motivated than ever to do what I need to do. But I think, obviously, having instruction from our head strength coach and Scott just kind of gives people a platform to say, like, okay, this is what I need to be doing. Because yeah. some people don't always know everything they need to do to, to become the best 
stop all play they need to be right? right it's like people need guidance so we're doing mandatory lifts a couple days a week we're doing mandatory uh conditioning a couple days a week um and then we are doing a lot of mental uh performance stuff so it's like a mental performance eight week kind of deal where we're just putting ourselves through different situations and learning and zoom calls with our positional groups like the pitchers we do a zoom call once a week and and talk about it and it's weird because it's like i'm not big to sit on social media or to sit on this and like want to like talk and and dive deep into all these things but it's almost like this has become the new norm right so uh, as much as i like sitting next to a teammate and being able to look them in the eye and tell them exactly how i'm feeling or this situation we don't have that luxury so this is kind of the next best thing that we have to deal with yep <laughs> it's, it's changed the way a lot of us are doing things so um Maybe we'll get into a little bit of pitching now. <laughs> um, and I know I want I want you to talk about when you're throwing a bullpen and, and what your process is because I think that can really help a lot of young athletes out there um, because you clearly have talked about intention and doing things deliberately and I think you bring a lot of that into that part of your training. So so yeah, walk us through kind of what your process is. Yeah, if I look down, it's because I'm looking at this paper. I had to write a bunch of stuff. <laughs> But I mean, as far as bullpens, the one thing that I will say is if you're going to go throw for 60, 70 minutes, it's too long, especially when you're young, you're 10, 11, 12 years old, you should be maxing out anywhere from a 35 to 40 minute, 40 minute window, because the intention span to be present in what you're doing for longer than 40 minutes is really, really hard on a younger athlete, right? And the one thing that I will continue to keep saying to pitchers is, if you're struggling or you're having a bad bullpen, the worst thing you can continue to do is to keep pitching and negative self-talk yourself throughout the whole thing because you're just going to dig yourself into a deeper hole. And I've learned that with experience and age that if I'm having a crap bullpen and I'm struggling and I'm starting to get negative on myself, I instantly, I just stop. I'm like, I'm good. Even if I throw for 15 minutes, I will take myself out of that equation because I know the experience piece plays a bigger part than today my body sucks my legs were tired I wasn't able to get my arm where I needed to at the curve relief just all those things so I think number one thing hold yourself accountable on that level if you get to the point where it's a constant like oh my god I'm struggling I suck this is terrible blah 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 no stop you should not be throwing you need to set another time do it in two days um I think it's important to go into to a bullpen with a plan right a lot of people just go not have a plan or expect a pitching coach to tell them exactly what they need to do. And I think you chose a, a rule that expects um, you to be the one in some of the biggest situations. Number one, you got to hold yourself accountable as far as pitches that you're comfortable in. But there's a lot of pressure that goes with your role. So it has to be going into a bullpen with the understanding of what is my intent today? What type of atmosphere am I trying to create? Um, and what's my plan? So when I will personally go into a bullpen, I obviously make sure I warm up because now at 33 years old, I can't just start throwing and I'm good. So I got to run. I have to do my dynamic warm up. Takes five to six minutes. Um, we'll throw overhand like most pitchers do. Um, I'm really big on long toss. So I will have so many people send me messages on what drills do you do? What's this? What's that? I'm not a huge drill master, but one thing that I always do before I warm up in games and what I do in cages is I throw long toss. So I will back myself up to the, probably the middle of the cage and I will throw to the highest part of the cage, 20, 30 pitches. Now, the reason why I love long toss is not only does it warm your whole body up because you're trying to create as much power with your lower half, but when you're out on an actual field throwing to a catcher, the number one thing that people will ask, how do you throw hard? Well, you have to be able to understand the use of your legs, but you also have to have a strong arm, strong forearm. You have to build up that strength. So the farther you're able to go back and throw long toss to get the ball to go up for height, opposed to like this, is right. going to work body more because you're going to have to use your lower half more and generate more power now if you want the ball to go up you have to create more of an of a arm slot where your where your body's back but you got to work your arm more so the more you're able to throw long distance you're going to strengthen your forearm and your arm's going to get stronger so that's something that can benefit athletes so i'll do that you know 15 to, to 25 pitches in a bullpen that's my number one because that just gets my body warm gets me going um I like to go in and I like to warm up all my pitches at once. So 
So uh -huh. I'll do that 10, 12 minutes. Doesn't take long. I don't look too much into it. I'm just routine based. So for me, even though I'm planning on just throwing a curve or a screw today, I like to just warm everything up to get my body going. I go in the same order, rise, screw, curve, change, backdoor, drop. I throw that over and over and over again. That's just me. Um, so once I warm everything up, I set myself up, I get my plate, I got everything going. I like to work two pitches from anywhere to five to 10 minutes. So for me, this is just an example of what I would do in a bullpen. Like I would just work curve screw for 10 minutes, curve screw 10 minutes, work on spot work, work on exactly where I want to throw it. You could have the ability to say, okay, I'm going to throw the first time through a curve. I'm going to throw OO, next pitch, O2, screwball, OO, screwball, O2. And setting that visual up for your mind, because 10 minutes can sometimes take a while, but I think when you are able to understand, okay, I need to buckle down. This is a O2 pitch. I can't put it too much on the plate, but I have to break it off enough. Um, and then I always incorporate a change. So then I will go curve, screw, change, five to seven. Usually I'll take a break. And the one thing I think that I feel like I've needed to do is to incorporate a lot of overhand throws throughout a bullpen session. Because the one thing I've seen in the game at times is that pitchers have a tough time throwing overhand after they've thrown underhand for 40, 50 pitches. So I will always incorporate my catcher to roll me ground balls, five, six reps throwing overhand after I've just thrown 20 minutes underhand, just to get the feel of what it feels like for my arm. Because coming back into the game, that's what I've learned has been the hardest. Is like throwing a bunch and then, oh, God, a ball comes back. I got to go to two. So I always incorporate that three to four times throughout a bullpen. The next thing I do is like I will just focus on change up 10 minutes straight. Change up, two in, two out, two in, two out, two in, two out. And I say that because the change up is the most important pitch someone needs to have. That's your bread and butter pitch. To be able to change speeds in the game is huge. You look at some of the best pitchers in the game. Um they have change-ups. I mean, Monica Abbott with Team USA is probably one of the only pitchers that doesn't use it much, but she also throws 73 miles an hour. So if you don't have the ability to throw 70 plus, the importance to be able to have a change-up to just add value to your other pitches is so important. So for me, I've learned that with Russell Cooper, who came, who was our pitching coach, was really big on making sure you set aside that time to just care on that, care and love on that pitch. Change up, change up, change up. Um, so I'll do that for about 10 minutes and then I'll change it and I'll go five, 10 minutes, rise in, rise out, rise in, rise out, rise in, rise out. And sometimes rise can be harder on your body. So I will say like, even if it's not 10 minutes, maybe five minutes of, of throwing that. Cause it is, especially for little, for little girls, it can be harder to throw that pitch. So right. taking you know, less time to do that and then I'll incorporate rise change and then I'll go back and I will just throw change ups again change up, change up, change up, change up. Because that pitch to me is a pitch I think about in some of the biggest moments. That's the pitch I usually go to. Not all the time, but that's the pitch where I think of like, man, back in the national championship run, some of the biggest pitches I ever threw were big time bases loaded, change up, need it. So you need to throw it more than anything else because that's the pitch almost at times I needed more than anything. Um, and then I'll also go back and I'll, you don't have to throw every single pitch, every bullpen, but this is just an example of a day where I would want to throw every pitch. So then I would, after I throw my change, five, seven minutes, I'd throw my backdoor curveball, which looks like it's going to hit a right-handed hitter and cut back in for a strike, um, opposite side of a regular curve. So I'll throw that to five, 10 minutes, and then I will throw the drop for five to 10 minutes. And I think mm -hmm. the importance, which I did not understand until I came back into the game, to solely focus on kind of one to two pitches is really important for the mental imagery of what you're doing. Because mm. I think in order to see yourself throw those pitches and see them spin and see them work and work and work is what pumps more value into your dome, which allows your brain to be like, nice, like I've done it, I've seen it, pitch after pitch after pitch, I've thrown that pitch, I know how to throw it. So I think it's really right. important to be able to spend the time individually on one to two pitches at a time opposed to the constant mix of all your pitches the whole time. Um, and I usually will end a bullpen with throwing like actual live, like, okay, let's put a hitter in there. And we have um, these L screens in the D bats that I train at, or I'll use buckets. And sometimes my catchers hate me, but for me, this is kind of, I think what separates 
the difference between a pitcher that feels comfortable and not comfortable is I will give myself potentially that big of a slot to throw a pitch. So I will put a barrier on, if I'm throwing a curveball into a lefty, I will put a barrier where the middle of the plate is to the right-handed hitter. And I will leave myself that much room to break the curveball down and into that tiny slot. Because to me, being able to do that allows for me to know that I can do it, right? And I think when you think about big time spots, when you're in the moment, you can't remember exactly where, okay, God, I remember I did it in this tiny space, but it just fills the mental bucket to say like, yes, I threw it. I was in this tiny little space. I was able to break the curveball, low and in. And I think that that just adds more for you to feel like, nice, like I'm putting in work today. And yeah. the more you Test yourself in different areas. I used to do a lot of string work, rise okay. ball, drop ball yep. throw it in, throw the drop ball over, throw the rise ball up underneath. Um, I just think it allows to check off those boxes for yourself to say like, nice, like I can do it. Um, so usually I'll mix pitches, do a couple times through, and I always like to try to end with what's it's kind of like cardio pitching. So what I'll do is I'll either do one or two rounds of throwing from the 43 feet, like a walkthrough, and I run to the catcher, get the ball okay. back. So I'll do that sometimes two rounds of 10, and it's just like you're just getting the cardio up at the end of the session, and then I end it and I'm good. And one thing, one training tool I feel like that's benefited me immensely and not everyone can obviously have this but i'm sure you've heard of those like little massage guns yeah 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 that's like a theragun or yeah. yes that has been the hyperbolt for me has been so clutch like i will bring it especially going back to pitch again when you haven't thrown in a little bit i will just take that thing on my forearm get up in my shoulder do mobility stuff and get in um and that has been a game game changer for me at my age yes at 10 you don't need it um, <laughs> athletes that are throwing, you know, six, seven games in a weekend, you have to recover your body properly and help, help yourself in that, in those types of situations. So I think being able to invest in those types of things is huge because it's really, it's almost like someone could just give me a personal massage at all times. <laughs> Sounds pretty, pretty great. Um, that's probably <laughs> it. Like bullpens, it's going in with the plan structure, even if you yeah. write stuff and go into it with that intent yeah so I was just gonna ask you like do you write it down or are you like is it all mental that that you're like okay today this is exactly what I'm gonna work on um, yeah. today I mean I usually will kind of know in my head you know like yeah. I haven't worked on the change the drop is still a new pitch for me like I need to spend more time doing this I don't enjoy throwing rise balls much because it is harder on my body so today I need to focus more on that because that is a pitch that I need to utilize more. And it's just having that game plan and being okay with sometimes having a bad day, that's fine. But I, I think being able to expose your weaknesses is the beauty of sport because you can't always love on your best stuff. The changeup for me is a pitch I'm always gonna love on because it's been my bread and butter pitch. But I think being able to work on other things outside from the east-west of screw curve, up down, will be an important factor for me. So I've learned that, I've learned to be uncomfortable in that and, and work on it to know that there might be a time when I need to throw this pitch, but I know that I put the hay in the barn and, and I've worked my, my butt off to be prepared for that moment. That's great. Um, kind of talking about making a plan, um, can you talk about what you do pre-game, like with your catcher and coaches in terms of talking about the pitchers you're about to face and that kind of stuff like can you can you walk us through what those conversations are like yeah i'm so lucky to still be playing this game with rafter you know we're going on um which will be 13 years strong here and i just think even before that i mean we were together on the team in, in 2007 so the relationship and dynamic that i have with her is the two against one mentality right off the bat because Raptors got my back no matter what. And what I've always valued about her, and I can't speak for other pitchers, I can only speak for how my relationship is with her is she's been able to talk me off the ledge multiple times, but she's also able to have the hard conversations with me and sometimes tell me stuff I don't wanna hear. And I love that because my personality is out there. And when you're in the circle and you're emotional and there's stuff going on and there's pressure and there's this and there's that, you need someone to get you back into your zen. You need someone to be able to hold you to that standard 
that you know that you need to be at. So, I mean, as far as pregame, it starts a lot before that. If we're playing, you know, if we're playing in Australia, it starts a couple of days before as far as our game plan, what we want to do, our conversations we have of past success against them for me. Are we going to hold the pitch the first time through the lineup? What do you want to see me do? And I like to bounce up off her before I say this is my exact plan. Um, but one thing I do know at the end of the day is I always hold myself accountable. And if she throws a pitch that I don't want to throw and I shake, I throw what I want to throw. And pitchers need to get that through their heads. You have to throw what in your gut feels like the right pitch. Don't throw a pitch because someone else calls it. That's the number one thing I would say. And I feel like we've been given enough on this national team to where we're at now, where Coach Smith really trusts where we're at. He doesn't need to sit in on these pitcher catcher meetings and give a bunch of, you know, opinions on stuff. He may say, oh, this is what I see or that, but he trusts us. And that's the right. biggest, the biggest deal. You have to trust the people you're putting out there. So I work hard on that with Rafter in regards to knowing she puts in the homework and watches a ton of video. I watch a little bit. I can't watch hours and hours and hours. Yeah. But I trust her because I know she's sat here in a scenario like this. We'll watch video see what's going on, have those conversations with me. Um, and when I'm in some of those biggest moments, there's been times I've, I will shake her and throw a pitch that I want to throw and it gets hit and she comes and she'll say something to me like, dude, this is why I didn't want to throw that. And then, and I'll just reiterate to her, that was a moment where I felt like I needed to go with this and I take full ownership because at the end of the day, I have to take full ownership of what's going to happen. It is the right. hardest on the team. You're in the biggest pressure situations at times. You are throwing a ball. You're trying to locate. At the end of the day, the accountability piece comes from you. It doesn't come from your catcher, your coach. Yes, they're there to help you, but you need to be in control of those moments to be able to deal with the good and the bad. Because it, it, when you really think about it realistically, like I've lost some some pretty big time games more than I've won some of the best ones, and. Right. The come out of those games are the ones that are able to deal with the failure and deal with the loss and deal with the responsibility of, I gave up a pitch that that girl hit out and we lost. And you may feel like you lost it for the whole team. I don't feel that way. I feel like this is the role that I enjoy and I put in the work to hope that that doesn't happen, but how you bounce back and the work you put in when you do fail speaks volumes to why you chose a position and the character that you bring to the table as far as what you're all about. I will never blame anybody else for something that I take responsibility for. I'm talking errors, I'm talking, I'll never, ever, ever, it'll be like, I should have made a better pitch, I should have done that. Because at the end of the day, blame does nothing. And I chose this role to take the accountability 150% at all times, because people need to know that they can count on me. They can count on me to throw the biggest and some of the best and the worst and know that like I still will have their back and hope that they will return that favor because there's a lot sometimes on our shoulders. Do you think that that comes from your experience, like to be able to to own the mistake, but not have that turn into the negative talk, right? Like that, like to to be able to know the difference between those two things, like does that only come from experience or do you think like a lot of the work you're doing with your um, mental uh, preparedness coach, like that kind of thing? Like, has that helped you? It's helped me. Um, I also know that like, I just like to take ownership. Like I'm not someone, I mean, I can realistically think of when I've been embarrassed in this game and it's maybe been about two or three times. Right. Like I'm not embarrassed of failure. I'm not, I don't fear what's going to happen. I don't fear us trying to go to an Olympics and train this hard for five games, maybe six, because what's the point? What's the point of doing all of this if I'm scared of it? Like I'm going in balls to the wall. This is what I got. You either love it or you don't. And I just appreciate those moments to be able to take ownership because that speaks volumes to character, right? People that are in moments where they struggle or do bad or blame, or man, that coach called this pitch and I didn't want to throw it, or the catcher did this and I wanted this, or that girl should have caught that and we lost because of that. No, no, I will never accept that. And don't get me wrong, sometimes stuff happens or there's an error or this person misses or that, yeah. but at the end of the day, this is a team sport and we need to respect each other and respect that like no one is ever doing anything intentionally to make you look bad or make this team look bad. 
we work our tails off to try to be the best that we possibly can. And I think respecting the game is my number one priority. How proud are you of your teammates right now and the work that they've put in? I'm, I'm, I'm proud. I prefer to be around my team. Yeah, <laughs> this is hard. Eh? It's definitely hard, but it's also, this is a very difficult time. And you yeah. don't know how everyone feels about this time. And that's okay. Like I can sit here and say like, right now I'm okay, but I don't know what everyone's mentality is right now. And not everyone might have access to everything, or I'm not saying everyone needs to go and be throwing multiple bullpens or going and hitting, but like, are we in the zone of the next 15 months? We're trying to get better. And I don't know. So I almost have a harder time because I expect so much from myself and I don't know if everyone's there. And that's not a bad thing. And I feel 100% okay with, with expressing that. Um, the expectation once September comes from me is that you're all in or we're gonna have to have those conversations because what I've learned is you truly are as strong as your weakest link on the team. And I can leave no stone unturned in this journey, but we have to be able to have those conversations if there is any doubt, because I know what it's I know what it's like to win. And I know that there's Jen was with me when we won the national championship. It's like we remember and we know. So it's like it's okay to hold people to that higher standard because what we're trying to do, no one's ever done. Yeah. We have never won an Olympic medal. Canada's not done it with softball. So if we want to be the first, the sacrifice is far greater than I think anyone has ever realized. And that's okay, but everyone has to be all in. We all have to be all in in the same direction. And your all in may look different than mine because I'm juggling kids and family and work but you got to respect the grind. You have to respect the work ethic and you have to put forth that amount of effort knowing you might not get the reward at the end. And I'm proud that this team has stuck together and we're all going to go through this and fight this out again. Um, but I don't know exactly where everyone's head's at, right? Because we just don't get to all sit and talk as a group and to be able to have those open Issues. And I'm not one to have a hard talk with anybody over a computer. I will have a face to face yeah. ever needs to, to happen. But um, I'm proud to be a part of this team again. And I know that like this additional year will be beneficial for us, maybe more than any other team. This is going to give us a chance to work harder, be better, more reps and hold each other to a higher standard. That's great. What does uh, life hold for you after 2021? What's how do you think that softball will factor into your life after after the Olympics are over? Um, you know, I'm really lucky with my job. I do the sports broadcasting, and it's crazy to think that right now should be regionals, super regionals, World Series. Yeah. I should be broadcasting it, and it literally like tears my heart out. But I'm lucky to be around the game. I love it. I love it so much that it doesn't feel like work to me. Like when I get to go and call these games and talk with these athletes and give them my two cents or they come up and they're either fangirling and want to talk to me about my experience. I love that. So I think for me, it's really always been about getting to give back to the game. But like I can say when I'm in those moments of calling some of the biggest games in a regional, super regional world series studio stuff, I get goosebumps watching because it's like, not only have I experienced it, so I know, but it's like these young women are on such a different platform now because the exposure of the game has gotten so much better that these women are iconic. And that's an amazing thing for this sport and for women to feel that way. So it's like pressure is a privilege, enjoy. So I love that I get to be around it still. Um, and, and quite honestly, like I'll be stoked to be retired. Like I will, like I came out of it and I was happy but it is a lot. And for me to continue this mental workload and be able to do this year after year after year, I wouldn't be able to do it. Um, and that's why I do care so much because I know it's my last hurrah and I'm gonna give it everything that I have, but I'll always be a part of the game somehow, whether it's broadcasting or a camp or a clinic or helping out an individual, just something like that. All right, I have one, we've taken a lot of your time and we're so appreciative, but I have one last question I wanna end on. Um, if you could go back and tell 12 year old Danielle something, what would that be? Yeah, 
I would say continue to work the process on, on how hard you work, but you need to work just as hard on the mental game. I learned that in college and I learned it late, you know, like my first two years of college, it was almost as if you don't even know what happened. I wasn't that good. <laughs> you know, and it took the Olympic year to hit me hard to be like, I got to be better. I have to be, right. I have to be more work because if the expectation for me is to pitch every game and I need to be the most mentally tough, if I'm not putting the work in on that level, then talent's only going to get me so far. Right. And for me, what's helped with the mental game is obviously working as hard as I physically can and pushing my body to that max to check off that mental bucket of like you're putting in the work. But there's other ways to be done, whether it's reading books, whether it's visualization. Um, so I would tell myself to obviously keep continue that grind, but know that you've got to put more work in and it, it should start now. That's awesome. Well, thank you so much, Danielle. This is uh this has been awesome to have you here and, and talk to us. And I'm sure um everyone has gotten some some great pearls of wisdom from you. And we look forward to watching you on the field again soon um yeah. so thanks and best of luck with your training and your journey moving forward thank you thank you guys for having me i appreciate it big time oh, this is great that will conclude today's webinar thank you very much for joining us today if you have any comments or suggestions for our speaker series webinars feel free to send them to Gilles leblanc or angela ballantyne at softball canada the next Rawlings Canada Speaker Series webinar will be all about defense with our guest speakers, Victoria Hayward and Chris Jones, at 7 p.m. Eastern on Tuesday, May 26. Please make sure you register at softball.ca. Cela conclut notre webinar d'aujourd'hui. Merci beaucoup d'avoir participé. Si vous avez des commentaires ou des suggestions pour ces webinars, veuillez les envoyer à Gilles Leblanc ou Angela Ballantyne à Softball Canada. Le prochain webinaire de softball de Rawlings Canada sera tout sur la défensive avec nos invités spéciaux Victoria Hayward et Chris Jones à 19h, mardi le 26 mai. Assurez-vous de vous inscrire à softball.ca.